Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wallace Collections July seminar in the history of collecting. I'm Suzanne Higgett. I'm one of the curators at the Wallace Collection um, and delighted to welcome you. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome this evening's speaker, Monica Rollo, and her co-researcher and collaborator on this lecture, Noe Conejo. Noe Conejo is from the province of Badajoz uh, in southwest Spain. He has a PhD in archaeology from the University of Seville and the University of Lisbon. He's an expert in numismatics and ancient economy and a member of the research group De Terdetitania Abetica, which in a nutshell seeks to understand the relationship of the Greek world with the rest of the Mediterranean and the impact of that interaction. Noe is also a researcher at Lisbon University's Archaeology Centre. Monica Rolo is from Cascais, uh, near, near Lisbon in Portugal. She has a PhD in archaeology from the University of Lisbon. She's an archaeologist and like Noe, a researcher at Lisbon University's Archaeology Centre. In recent years, Monica and Noe have been collaborating on research into the history of the archaeological collections of the Portuguese royal family from the 16th to the 19th centuries. Last year, they published a book on the subject of this evening's talk. The book was published by the Fondação da Casa de Braganza. Noe gave a presentation about the book at Villa Vesosa in October last year. This reminded me that following my own visit to Villa Vesosa, the residence of the Dukes of Braganza, in 2015, the director of the Museu Biblioteca da Casa de Braganza at Villa Vesosa, Maria de Jesu Monge, gave a lecture about the ceramics collection of the Portuguese royal family in our History of Collecting seminar series. So it may be that some of you attended that seminar. Monica and Noe have also collaborated on a forthcoming publication titled The House of Braganza and Egypt, The Story of a Royal Passion. During and after Monica's talk, please send in any questions you have for Monica and Noe through the Q&A. It's my great pleasure now to invite you, Monica, to present your and Noe's lecture, A Dactyliotech by Pietro Bracci in the Portuguese Royal Family's Collections, A Different Look at art collecting. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, Suzanne. Good afternoon to you all. I would like to start thanking Suzanne and Natalia for this opportunity to be here today with you. And I will start our presentation. Well, we present to you today this Dactyliotheca from Pietro Bracci that is incorporated in the Portuguese royal family collections. We have organized our presentation in five points. And we'll start explaining why this dactyliotheca from the Royal House collections is in Villa Viçosa and not in Lisbon, the capital. Well, the dactyliotheca we present to you today is part of the collections of the Museum Library of House of Bragança. This museum is located in the Ducal Palace of Vila Viçosa, a small village in the south of the Portuguese territory. The reason why the Museum Library of House of Bragança is located in Vila Viçosa has to do, in the first place, with the history of this noble family that since um, 1640 became the Portuguese royal family. Villa Viçosa was the birthplace of the lineage of Bragança and during the 16th and 17th centuries was an important political, economic, economic and cultural center. It was the headquarters of the House of Bragança states. In the second place, the creation of the museum library of House of Bragança results from the will of Dom Manuel II, the last king of Portugal. On his will, Dom Manuel determined that after his death, all his private collections should be brought together in a museum of public utility, 
located in Portugal and named House of Bregança Museum. This wish led to the creation of the Museum Library of House of Bregança, installed in the Ducal Palace of Villa Viçosa, which for the last generations of the royal family had been used as a summer residence. The Dukes of Bragança, the taste for collecting art and archaeology. The taste for historical archaeology, archaeological heritage and for collecting has been associated to the House of Bragança since its first members. In the 16th century, Don Teodosio, the fifth Duke of Bragança, was responsible for rescuing and collecting a set of votive Roman inscriptions from the sanctuary dedicated to the indigenous deity in Dovelico, in São Miguel da Mota. Uh, São Miguel da Mota is located near Villa Viçosa, in a village, in a small village, village named Alandrual. Over time and alongside a demanding intellectual and artistic education, the different generations of the House of Bragança gathered numerous collections, collections of art, furniture, ceramics, tapestry, clothing, jewelry, religious relics, armory, exotica, and naturalia. In the 18th century, King Don Juan V, so John V, the 11th Duke of Bragança, supported by royal decree, the creation of the Royal Academ Acad Academy of Portuguese History. One year later, in 1721, the same king promulgated what was the first national law in favor of the protection of historical, archaeological, and cultural heritage. In, Dece in December 1779, during the reign of Queen Mary I of Portugal, the Royal Academy of Sciences of Lisbon was created. This academy was distinguished by its teaching activity and scientific production in natural sciences and humanities. While still an infant, Dona Maria I had visited the Roman ruins of Troia, located in the south of uh, Portugal, near, in this case, Near the, near the sea, so in a place called Grandula. And as we shall see, this was the first of several visits made by members of the Portuguese royal family to this Roman archaeological site. In 1949, ruling Queen Mary II, the Lusitanian Archaeological Society was created to promote, a, to promote the archeological works in the Roman ruins of Troia. I would like to call your attention to this piece. It's a silver a cup that came from Troia and that um, is included in the, in the collections of archeology span of the Museum Library of House of Bragança. This Lusitanian Archaeological Society has counted with the royal protection by Dom Fernando II, husband of the Portuguese Queen Mary II. The king gave his financial support to continue the excavation works in the ruins of Troy. Nevertheless, nevertheless, after three archaeological campaigns, the Lusitanian Archaeological Society was extinguished in 1800. 67. Don Fernando stood known as the king artist and distinguished himself as a great collector, patron of arts and protector of archi architectural and archaeological heritage. He gathered painting collections, jewelry collections, armory, furniture, glassware and ceramics collections which were added to other older collections from the Portuguese royal house to form what would become known as the Royal Museum. All these collections were brought together in Palacio das Necessidades, 
which has been, which was then the official residence of the Portuguese royal family. In 1864, ruling King Don Luís I, the Association of Portuguese, Portuguese Civil Architects and Archaeologists, afterwards named Royal Association, was founded. Don Fernando II, King's Don Luís father, was honorary president of this association, as well as his grandson, Don Carlos. Don Luís, that we see here in this portrait, stood known as the king, king numismatiste for the, his interest in coins and his large collection of coins and medals. He was responsible for the creation of a painting gallery in the north wing of the royal palace and of the so-called archaeological collection of Ajuda Palace. His son, Prince Dom Carlos and future King Carlos I of Portugal, financed an elementary course in archaeology, the first of its kind in Portugal, around the year 1885. One year later, he married Dona Amelia de Orleans, the eldest daughter of the Count of Paris, with whom he shared an eclectic education a refined artistic sensibility, a taste for travel, hunting, and an interest in archaeological heritage and collecting. In November 1897, King Don Carlos visited the Roman ruins of Troia. Due to his interest in antiquities and archaeology, excavation works were carried out. In this slide, we present to you one of the drawings made by the king during his visit to Troia. The, three, the last three generations of the Portuguese royal family were distinguished by their broad and solid intellectual and artistic training. Example of this concern with providing a wide theoretical and practical instruction were the educational travels aboard abroad undertaken by the royal family's infants. See, for instance, the tour through the Mediterranean and the travel to Egypt carried out by Queen Dona Amelia and the young princes Don Luis Felipe and Don Manuel in, 19, in 1903. The third part of our presentation is called the Grand Tour Trips, a great source for the purchase of art. We will try to give you the context in which this dactyloteca from Pietro Bracci is included in the Royal House collections. In 1770, Richard Lassell's book, The Voyage of Italy, or A Complete Journey Through Italy, was published in Paris. It was a small handbook for English students who wanted to visit France and Italy in order to learn about the legacy of ancient cultures, to know the most important works of art of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, as well as other languages. Richard Lessels used for the first time the term Le Grand Tour to designate the journeys made by the aristocracy, especially during their youth, throughout Europe. These travels were seen as an educational complement to the study of arts, politics, and languages, allowing the young aristocratic travelers to visit the countries with the best art galleries and the most impressive archeological remains, such as France and Italy. Between the 17th and 18th centuries, this kind of travels became more and more frequent. Later on, with the development of the railways and the subsequent decrease in journey, in journey time and costs, this practice became widespread. During the 18th century, other European scenarios besides France and Italy gained importance, 
such as Germany, Greece, or the Iberian Peninsula. Therefore, publications on these new destinations multiply. Like Richard Lessels, other authors of the, eight, of the 17th and 18th centuries published their impressions on the cultural tours undertaken with very detailed descriptions of the cities visited and the works of art they had had the opportunity to contemplate. Among others, we detached the books, several years travels through Portugal, Spain and Italy, and Remarks in the Grand Tour of France and Italy, both published by William Bromley, or Les Delices de l'Espagne et du Portugal, written by Alvarez de Colmenar, or also Travels through different cities of Germany, Italy and Greece, published by Alexander Drummond in 1756. With the popularization of the Grand Tour among the middle-class sectors of society, the publication of travel books increased significantly. The famous guidebooks by the editors Bedecker and Murray began to be published in the first half of the 19th century and became indispensable tools for planning any trip. In this slide, we bring to you when when the Decker guide that has the particularity of having belonged to Queen Dona Amelia. Grand tourists shared the special fascination for Rome, which stood out as the central scenario of classical antiquities history. The Roman buildings and ruins attracted the travelers as well as all the historical monuments and the rich archaeological collections displayed in important galleries, such as the Vatican Museums or the Capitoline Museums. But antiquities and replicas were not the only souvenirs these travelers acquired along their visit to Italy. Grand tourists often posed for a portrait, portrait having a classical ruin or an iconic monument as a scenario. It would serve as another testimony to their journey to Rome and reflected the romantic aura of the archeological ruins. And here we have another two portraits that reflect this fascination for archeology span and for the ancient um, monuments. Among the Portuguese royal house, the grand tours were also valued as an essential resource for the education of the young princes and their preparation for an institutional and public role. Like the previous generations, also Prince Carlos that we have here, future King Carlos I and Prince Dom Afonso, sons of King Don Luís I, undertook a travel through Europe in 1883. As Queen Dona Maria Pia, uh, their mother, was the daughter of King Victor Emmanuel of Italy, this tour enabled Carlos and Afonso to get to know their mother's country of birth up close. They visit several Italian cities, and at the end of the Italian tour, the royal entourage split up. Prince Afonso and the Queen Dona Maria traveled on to Switzerland, while Prince Carlos continued his journey through Belgium, Austria, France, and England. In 1903, it was the turn of the, turn of the princes Don Luis Felipe at the age of 16 and Don Manuel at the age of 14, sons of King Don Carlos and Queen Don Amelia, to undertake their first educational journey. This travel would, would be a bit different from the European tours undertaken decades earlier by their parents and grandparents. Firstly, because the prince's mother, Queen Dona Amelia, also took the journey 
and secondly, because the itinerary included several Muslim countries and very different landscapes to the usual European settings. For the study of this journey, we find the personal diaries, diaries of Prince Dom Manuel of extraordinary interest. And we, we bring to you one of the pages of these diaries. The royal entourage traveled through Spain, Gibraltar, Algeria, Tunisia, Malta, Egypt, Italy, and France. In this slide, we show to you the outward trip and the return trip. For this journey, we, have also a set, we also have a significant set of photographs, which give us a closer look at the royal traveler's routine. In addition to the training and daily sessions, uh, daily lessons, the young princes, as well as their mother, Queen Dona Amelia, visited several monuments and museums and acquired exotic and archaeological artifacts that would be added to the royal collections. For example, the Portuguese queen was offered a set of 200 Egyptian artifacts by the vice king of Egypt and Sudan during this trip. This offer complemented the Egyptian collection of the late king Don Luis. I would like to, to, to call your attention for a fact that five years later, so we, here, we, ha, we are in 1903, and in 1908, the assassinations of King Don Carlos and of the young prince Luis Felipe forced Don Manuel, that we see here, it's the smaller one, forced Don Manuel to take the Portuguese uh, throne. He reigned as Don Manuel II until the establishment of the Portuguese Republic in 1910. Forced into exile, like all other members of the royal family, Don Manuel was taken in by King George V in England, where he lived at Ful Fulwell Park until the end of his life in 1932. Finally, the dactyliotekai, the souvenir of the Grand Tour. The use of dactyliotekai seems to be as ancient as the origin of the term itself. Apparently, it was Pliny who first used the word in the first century after Dominus. After the fall of Rome of the Roman Empire, and during the early Middle Ages, dactyliotekai felt into oblivion. However, their use was gradually restored among the Mediterranean aristocratic circles. For example, the Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII gathered a vast collection of engraved gems, inscriptions, and books during his reign. The numerous gems that decorate the treasure of St. Mark's, that we have here an image, St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, also came from Constantinople, probably brought by Venetian crusaders as war booty following the capture of the city during the Fourth Crusade. During the Renaissance, the interest in this type of object and its collecting increased among the more well-educated and wealthy elites. The pontificate did not resist this practice and Popes Paul II and Sixtus IV are said to have been the most famous gem collectors of their time. These elites were in contact with the best antique dealers, some of which were also collectors themselves. One of the most famous anti antique dealers of the 16th century was the Dutch Abraham Gorlaeus. As a successful dealer, he gathered a collection of archaeological pieces during his many travels through Italy, including a large collection of engraved gems, 
and a numismatics cabinet from the Roman era. Both these collections are well known thanks to the catalogues published by Gorlaeus. One catalogue of gems and cameos published in 1601 and one catalogue of numismatics published in 1607. From the Renaissance until the 19th century, there were several kings who also showed an interest in engraved gems and cameos. We speak, for example, of Charles IX of France, who was responsible for organizing a significant collection of gems in the Louvre Palace, of uh, George III of England, who bought the, the, the dactyliotecae of the diplomat Joseph Smith, or of Frederick II of Prussia. This king, Frederick II, bought the majority share of the gem collection of Philip von Stosch. Von Stosch was a German antique dealer who traveled through Europe during his youth and lived in Rome and Florence. He gathered the collection of over 10,000 gems and cameos, and after his death, his collection was sold out to different buyers, including Frederick II of Prussia and Christian Den, who, we'll, who we will speak about later. We must also mention Catherine the Great, perhaps the most famous figure associated with gems collecting. The Empress gathered an important collection of engraved gems and cameos, which today form the basis of the gems collection of the Hermitage Museum. She acquired some significant tactiliotecae by buying them from noblemen in economic difficulties. One of these examples is the Orléans collection, gathered by Philip II, Duke of Orléans, during the first half of the 17th, 17th century. Later on, in 1787, his great-grandson, Louis Philip II of Orléans, sold the entire collection to Catherine the Great in order to overcome financial difficulties. From the 18th century onwards, due to the high cost of these items, some craftsmen specialized in the manufacture of engraved gems and cameos in materials less expensive, imitating the originals. This gave, gave rise to copies of engraved, engra engraved gems and dactyliotecae made of plaster, plaster, wax, ceramics, or glass paste. This type of reproduction became an indispensable and affordable souvenir sought by grand tourists. One of the first to produce this type of item with high quality was the German Philipp Daniel Lippert, who was a glassmaker, a ceramist, and a draftsman. He published, he published the three volumes of Dactyliotheca Universalis, this compilation of the best gems and cameos from the most representative collections of the time became a work of reference and was used by other artists for the making of reproductions. Typically, the dactyliotecae used to store original gems or copies were organized in small pieces of furniture similar to the coin trays kept in antique cabinets. Gradually, and especially with the increasing vulgarization of reproductions, they were stored in small decorated boxes made of wood or pressed paper, which resembled real books. Another renowned gem engraver copist was the Dutch Christian Den. 
He settled in Rome, where he worked not only as an art and antiques dealer, but also as a fabricant of cameos, gems, and molds in glass or ceramic based. He gathered a large collection of gems and cameos, including part of the von Stott, von Stott collection, as, we've ha as we have already mentioned. After Den's death, the business was, take was taken over by Francesco Maria Dolce, who was also a craftsman and art dealer. Dolce published a catalog of all the pieces collected and manufactured by Christian Den, thus making known the full contents of Den's collection. There were many other craftsmen in the 18th century who specialized in the manufacture of engraved gems, cameos, and, the, and their reproductions. For example, the Italian Bartolomeo Pauletti, Antonio Pischler, and Giovanni Pischler, or the Scottish-born James Tacey, who had his workshop in London. Tacey received important orders from various royal houses of the time, including of Catherine the Great. By the end of the 18th century and early 19th century, Dactyliotecae, given their wide iconographic repertoire, gained a remarkable importance as a teaching and learning resource in educational contexts, such as universities and art academies, and in private, private aristocratic circles. In Göttingen, the first German university to offer lectures on archaeology, Christian Gottlob Heine used dactyliotecae in his teaching, enhancing their value as graphic resources of transmission of ancient history and art. Throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries, the acquisition of dactyliotecae by educational institutions became commonplace. One of the institutions that was most active in acquiring these pieces was the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Ivan Ivanovich Betskoy was nominated director of the institution by Catherine the Great in 1764. He shared with the Empress a taste for gem and cameos collecting and acknowledged the importance of dactyliotecae as teaching aid. He gathered a dactyliotheca with more than 2,100 pieces, which was donated after his death to the, acad to the academy he had directed for 30 years. Other institutions where dactyliotecae played a noteworthy role as an educational resource were, for example, the Berlin Academy of Art and the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando in Madrid, Spain. Established by the Spanish King Fernando VI in 1752, the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando gathered an important collection of arts and archaeology. The importance of this collection was such that some of this, these pieces, like books, replicas, gems, cameos, and reproductions were taken to Central and South American territory to create art schools similar to those in the Spanish capital. Our dactyliotheca from Pietro Bracci. Pietro Bracci dactyliotheca were very popular in the 19th century and their wide diffusion was likely linked to the quality of his work and the accessible prices. Bracci succeeded in combining his artistic talent as an engraver and manufacturer of molds and plaster replicas with a commercial vision of his activity. He knew how to meet the demand of a white public, especially travelers and art lovers, interested in souvenirs that reproduced pieces of the collections of the most important Italian museums 
as well as views of the eternal city or emblematic monuments. The result of this business approach was the creation of Dactyliotecae that gave the buyer the possibility of touring through replicas of the gems and plaster cameos, the most famous art and archeological galleries of Rome of those days. The Dactyliotheca we are presenting to you today consists of 2,350 plaster molds of gems and cameos, reproducing pieces of art, antiquities, portraits, and mythological themes. The plaster molds are displayed in 38 numbered boxes, identified as products from Pietro Bracci's workshop at, home, at Rome. Sorry. Despite the wide dissemination of Pietro Bracci's work in private and public collections, the available information on this uh, artist is very scarce. Nevertheless, it is known that Pietro Bracci was part of a group of craftsmen who had their workshops located around Piazza di Spagna in Rome. These craftsmen were specialized in the manufacture of mosaics, replicas of archeological pieces, coins, carving, and reproduction of gems and cameos. We must highlight that we have no information on how and when this Bracci's Dactyliotheca was incorporated in the Portuguese royal family's collections, probably acquired between the late 18th century and the early 19th century. We assume it has been used in the learning routines of the last two generations of the Portuguese royal family. So we refer to the generation of Dom Carlos and Dom Afonso and of the following generation of the princes Don Luis Felipe and Don Manuel. This is the, the image or a photograph of one of the boxes and all the boxes are uh, the, have this same image with the title and the number. And by the title, we could say that we had three series, three thematic series. The first one is the larger one. We have 1,359 intaglios in 18 boxes. And we have pieces that reproduce Sumerian art, Renaissance art, and that um, are copies of um, important pieces from the Italian museums and the Louvre Museum. Then we have series two, that is uh, uh, composed by 18, uh, 810 molds in 15 boxes, and where we have the reproductions of the most famous engravers of the 18th century, like Giovanni and Luigi Pichler, or Nathaniel Marchand, James Stacy, among others. The original pieces came from the British Museum, Musée du Louvre, and Naples Museum. The smaller series is composed by 180 uh, plaster, mold, 80 plaster molds in five boxes. Uh, all the intaglios are made in the form of coins and they are all portraits of Roman emperors, medieval kings and modern rulers. In here, we show to you some uh, of um, the images some of the molds of this second and third series. To end, the interest for antiquities and the concern with the protection of the historical, archeological and uh, artistic heritage has been, as we have seen, transversal to different generations of the Braganza family. The taste for collecting and traveling has been specially cultivated by the last three generations of the Portuguese royal family. We are referring to the 18 and early 20 centuries. The collecting was assumed not only as a symbol of status and social distinction, 
but also as an important complement in an, in an educational model planned to be demanding and overarching. The incorporation of Bracci's Dactyliotheca in the collections of the Portuguese royal family between the late 18th century and the early 19th century reflects above all the mentality of the European refined elites of the time. That is a renewed interest for antiquity and the ideal pursue for self-improvement and a global worldview through an eclectic education and eye-lightening travels. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, me and We are looking forward to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for a wonderfully uh, clear uh, and beautifully organized and illustrated um, uh, lecture, which uh, was is really uh, fascinating looking at the whole development of this type of object and also your overview of the um, of the royal the Portuguese royal family and the generations of collectors and the different kinds of uh, objects that they were collecting. Um, please uh, do uh, send in any questions that you have for Monica and Noe through uh, the, the Q and A. Um, and I've just, um, I've, I've got a few questions myself, uh, which I'd love to ask you about. Um, and um, one of them is, I wondered why you talked, going right back to the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the um, Lusitanian Arche uh, Archaeological Society that was founded in 1850 and said that it, uh, and it had the uh, sort of patronage of Fernando II of Portugal. You said that it uh, came to an end uh, quite shortly afterwards in 1867. And I just wondered uh, why that was. Um, this um, association was composed by uh, craftsmen and marchands, local Martians from the area where the ruins uh, are located. And um, they weren't very well organized. And I think the association was extinguished, not because of lack of money, even though it could be uh, something that has uh, importance, but because they weren't able to be organized and organize the resources to carry it out, to carry out the archeological works in a structured way, like this project in the long term. And so the, the elements that compose the association start uh, quitting, if we may say, and it was naturally extinguished, even though it had the, the financial support of the king. Right. Yes, it's, uh, it sounds a shame, but it sounds a very yes. interesting um, organization. And we've got some um, questions uh, coming in. Claude, Claudia Wagner um, asks, is there a catalog for your set of impressions, a manuscript or a printed list? For this dactyliotheca? Mm -hmm. No, we don't have any kind this is one of the problems we had to deal with when we are doing our research. This dactyliotheca has any kind of information associated. So they usually would come with inventories or indexes. This dactyliotheca from Pietro Bracci doesn't have that kind of documentation, but we think originally, originally it should have, but as you can imagine, the process, the process of end of the monarchy and the beginnings of the Republic in Portugal were very difficult. And there are a lot of information, a lot of pieces that were lost. And we think that um, that must be the case of the documentation that was associated to this set of intaglios. So are there, you haven't then come across any identical sets uh, that do have, obviously that do have their in inventories with them? Yes. You, ha you haven't found any identical? 
we haven't uh, started our second phases of research that would lead us that way because this um this subject the the, the dactyliotecai in portugal is uh, practically unknown uh, when we started studying it we didn't knew what to expect because uh, there are only I should say like three or four museums that have this kind of collections available to the public. They are not, they aren't studied. So there is not, there is any research or there is little research on this theme. But we think that as soon as we get to know uh, other collections, not only in Portugal, but also abroad because Pietro Bracci work spread through all uh, through Europe, we will uh, find similar pieces. Yes, and that will help us to uh, get to know uh, better this collection of the royal house. Yes, thank you. So we've got some questions and comments coming in, um, and Jim Hensinger uh, asks: Were the individual items within the collections labelled with their subject? No, they only have the title. The title I've showed you on the cover of the box was the only information we had, but they all the all the cameos were are numbered. So that's one of the reasons we think if they are numbered and if the, the collection has this very well structured organization there should be an index, there should be an inventory. So are there many that you haven't managed to identify within the set at Villa Vissosa? Uh, the, the original provenance? No, the is? subject, no, the subject, the subject. of the cameos and the No, most of them are very, uh, even though we are not able to identify, for instance, the original pieces that they reproduce, most of the, the themes are mythological ones, uh, lots of portraits. Those are the uh, most difficult to identify. We have Greek and Roman uh, philosophers, thinkers, that those ones we can identify, but we have other portraits we are not able to identify. And it, it would be interesting to have parallels from other dactyliotecai to be able to recognize uh, each one of the, the portraits. Then we also have um, mostly is mythological themes and reproductions of pieces of art, monuments. Um, this is pretty much the uh, general subject of this collection. And this is one of the reasons we think it would be used in the lessons, in the training routine of the young uh, uh, royal infants. Um, and Stephen King's actually asked if we could see some of the, um, some of the cases of medallions again, um, just okay. have a little bit of a longer look, I'm going... which would be nice actually, if it's easy. Yes. I think you are referring to this one and this is the, the, the slide where we can see the best, right? Oh, yes. Only the third series has this kind of shape, like coins, the, the third series. The first and the second one, the intaglios shape is like this uh, cabochon, like medals. Yes, thank you for... Um giving people a chance to have another look at those. Um, and actually Noe has put in a comment um, thanking uh, Claudia Wagner for her question and saying, we're currently compiling a detailed catalog of all the boxes. Um, and uh, Jim Hensinger has asked, were the individual items unique or reproduced in many copies? I'm just going to close my window because you might be able to hear the drill outside. Um, so he's, he's wondering whether they are, the individual items are unique or reproduced in many copies. 
in this dactyliotheca, Susan? I think he must mean more generally, because presumably they no, generally they would be there. they would be repeat they would be repeated, reproduced several times, and people would go and buy the collection they wanted, right? But um, in this dactyliotheca, we don't have repeated motives. Each one is singular. But uh, Pietro Bracci produced, I, I, I suppose, uh, lots of uh, dactyliotecas, dactyliotecae, with the same, with the same uh, subjects, with the same representations. Do you know whether he would have produced different sizes of collections for various markets? I don't know if he has, because um, as we have told you, the, the information on Pietro Bracci is very, uh, it's very scarce. We, don't, we weren't able to understand when he, when he was born, when he died, we only knew that he lived around the 18th century and it stood in this, in this uh, foggy, in this foggy context. But uh, knowing his commercial vision, I would say that probably yes, yeah. they would adapt because Liber Lippert that we've talked, can I uh, run my slideshow back? Please do. Lippert was like this pioneer in um, producing dactyliotecae of different sizes. With um, he he had this idea of producing uh, dactyliotecae with ten thousand gems, and this this uh, this collection would be sold complete and with an inventory. And it was a huge success. And it was sold especially to universities and academies and this kind of educational institutions. And he also had this idea of creating this kind of book shaped case to put the intaglios that would um, make easier to, um, to use and to display on a cabinet or whatever they, they, would, be, they would be stored. Thank you. Uh, and we've got uh, a question here from Susan Jacks. Wonderful presentation, thank you. Thank Did you. the Renaissance popes keep their, their gem collections in boxes? The popes? Yes. Oh, I don't uh, Noé, do you know if the popes would keep uh, the gems collection in? No, we don't know. Don't know. Thank you. Um, I don't know uh, because this information don't <laughs> throw it. Doesn't survive the, that information. Thank you. Uh, and Claire Horn Hornsby. Um, has written, I wonder if the speakers know about the large cast collection made by William Dagood, a Scotsman in Parma, one of the Farnese collections of gems. He brought it to Portugal in the late 1730s and it was for sale, but the court did not acquire it and it went to England. Oh, I didn't know that. Ah, oh, right. Suzanne, could you please repeat the name? Of the yes, person. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but William, it's, I'll tell you the spelling. It's, so it's William Dugood, which is D-U-G-O-O-D, -O -O a Scotsman in Parma. Uh, and he brought it to Portugal in the late 1730s and it was for sale. And the, the royal family didn't want the, the royal family didn't bought them. Uh, it just says the, the court didn't acquire it and it went to England. Oh. But uh, in fact, you'll, I think you will get a copy of the, the, the Q&A coming in. So maybe you'll be able to be in touch with Claire Hornsby okay. and uh, find out more about that. Um, and then we have another question here from Nilu um, Katri. Uh, 
Hello, first of all, thank you for the wonderful seminar. It was very insightful. My question to you would be, did the expansion of the Portuguese empire abroad, for example, in India, have an impact on the collection? And if so, in what way? I would say it had an impact, probably it, it, it must have an impact, but in Portugal, we have a problem with the royal collections and I'll explain to you what is the problem. Um, the problem is in 1755, we had the big earthquake of Lisbon and uh, almost, almost all the collections of the royal family were kept in their palace in Lisbon in one of the areas that was most affected by the earthquake. So we have some collections, but it's the smallest part. And we have some exotic elements that are for sure from other areas of the Portuguese empire. But unfortunately, there is a lot, a lot of information, a lot of collections that were all lost in this earthquake. When I, in the beginning of my presentation, I've told to you about Don Teodosio. He was the, one of the most relevant dukes of Braganza. Of him, and he was one of the most important men of his time. And he gathered in uh, like this collection of um, ancient epigraphs that he had this, uh, how can I say, he asked people in different countries from Europe to tell him about Roman inscriptions or ancient inscriptions. And those inscriptions would be compiled in a book or in many different books. And this would be nowadays precious information for archeologists. And we know that these books were lost in the earthquake. So a uh, lots of things, um, we don't have, a, an, we have an idea, but we don't know what exactly would be the royal collections in uh, or in their maximum splendor, if I may say like this. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few comments here from um, Noe. So I'll just uh, uh, briefly go, go through them. They're in response to some of the questions that have come in. And um, uh, to Jim um, Hensinger, he says uh, that the collection at Villa Visosa is one of many copies um, made by Pietro Bracci, which actually I think you'd already uh, mentioned, Monica, in your talk. And then to Claire Hornsby, um, who talked about, asked if you knew about the collection that was taken uh, for sale in Palma. He says, uh, we are aware of, of it, but there's no documentation in Portugal um, about it. Uh, and uh, then to uh, Nilu Katri's uh, question about um, whether the uh, empire, the Portuguese empire uh, had an influence on the content of the collection. Um, he says, there are pieces from the for, for, uh, former Portuguese colonies in India that are today part of the main museums in Portugal. Um, that's undoubtedly due to uh, Portuguese um, expansion. Uh, right, and then um, uh, Michelle Chu has said, uh, following on from the last question, I too am fascinated by the impact or influence of the Portuguese royal families dactyliotai sourcing or current presence given Portuguese global exploration in the 16th to 18th centuries. So I'm just trying to um, work out what the, the question is. Um, I think it's, um, it's about, the, again, about the sourcing, whether the Portuguese global exploration uh, mm -hmm. had a direct influence on the content of the, um, of the collection. Um, oh, in, in, in the three parts of the collection of the, may, yeah, yeah. May I add something, Suzanne? Yes, please. Uh, I think one of kind of turning point in the royal family and in the collecting by the royal family 
is in fact the marriage of Queen Mary II with the German Prince Don Fernando because he has such a refined and such an overarching education that he is going to bring to Portugal and he's going to um, make sure that their sons also have. And from that moment onwards, I think, um, uh, how can I say, mentalities are changing. That's, that's normal, they are changing in Europe, but in Portugal, things were a bit slower. And with, Don, with the arrival of Don Fernando, the family, the royal family, I think it opened up more to the European enlightenment. And that reflects in the collections, in my opinion, and also in the uh, educa educational models that are presented to the, um, to the infants. Thank you. That's very interesting. And Noe has um, written in again, uh, saying that uh, there's a very important collection uh, on the subject of the Portuguese sort of empire uh, on display at the Geographical Society of Lisbon. Uh, and also they've also published important catalogues. Uh, and he's put in a link, which is really helpful. Uh, and uh, Claire Hornsby um, who has also, she's put in her email address, so you'll okay. get that so you can be directly um, in touch okay, with her. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, do please put them into um, the Q&A or the, the, um, the chat. Um, I had a question about, you mentioned near the beginning, the archaeology archeolo collection of the Ajuda Palace. And um, I just was, I don't remember seeing that when I visited the palace and I wondered if it's still there, the archeological collection. Do you remember or don't remember? Oh, sorry. No, I, I don't remember, but I was probably just looking at the glass collections of uh, Queen Amelia, which- uh, I, 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 think, I think it isn't in exhibition. Right. The, this uh, archeological collection, that was the sum of many collections that were gathered a long time uh, has been split. So you have some of the archeological collections in Villa Vissosa, in the museum, uh, not, not in the palace, but in the castle. Yes, yes. In the archeology uh, archeology muse museum. We have part of the archeological collections of Don Luis and also of Reina Dona Amelia. We also have uh, artifacts from this royal collections in the National Museum of Archaeology in Lisbon. And somehow they, they were split. And also this uh, cup of Troia, the silver cup of Troia is part of these collections because she was offered by one of the presidents of the um, Lusitanian Archaeological Society to the King Don Fernando II. And it stood with the royal family until, well, until nowadays. But it's very interesting because uh, this silver cup uh, was forgotten for, for a few, for like 150 years, that is. It was known that the cup had been offered to Don Fernando and he, he, that he owned it. And then it is said, the, the documentation, we have, uh, we have uh, had the opportunity to, to read, says that the last time it was seen was in the cabinet of Don Fernando grandson, so Don Carlos. And uh, afterwards, no one recalls what happened to the silver cup until recently in 2016, Dra. Maria Jesus Monge rediscovered the silver cup in Villa Viçosa. No one knew where it was. And some uh, archeologists, some, um, some researchers thought it was like this invention 
someone had uh, uh, described a silver cup from Troia, but that, re that wouldn't exist. No, it's real. And uh, probably what happened to this cup uh, may have happened to a lot of other pieces from the royal family collections. Because have, as I've said, all the process of uh, exile of the royal family and implantation of the re Republican system in Portugal is a very difficult one. And they uh, make this division between what is royal family property and what becomes public property, what becomes from the Portuguese state. And they only leave for the royal family, for the royal members or for the members of the royal fam family that were in exile, they only leave to them their private collections, the personal ones. Whatever was uh, considered of artistic or historical value was kept for the Republic. Yeah, a really complicated um, a bit. story, yes. Wonderfully exciting moment though, with the rediscovery of the Silver yes. Cup. Really sounds a uh, oh. fabulous moment, yeah. Thank you. So we haven't got um, any more questions coming in, um, but there were some really interesting uh, aspects uh, following on for your talk, uh, from, from your talk came, came up. Um, so if you'd like to join the Wallace Collections History of Collecting mailing list and receive our seminar programme for the rest of the year, um, as well as the abstract in advance of each of the separate seminars, then please do get in touch with us at collection at wallacecollection.org. And Monica, if you're able to take, while well, I'm speaking, just bring up that last slide. It will give yes, the title and the date. Sure of oh, the next sorry. seminar, that's fine. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. That is absolutely fine. Uh, but it's just um, helpful for people. This one. The, the next one, yeah, the, that's it, that's lovely, thank you. So here you have um, the email address if you want to join our mailing list, collection at wallacecollection.org. Our call for papers for seminar proposals for two, uh, 2022 went out recently. So if you've got uh, a uh, seminar that you'd subject that you'd like to propose for next year's seminars, please do send us a proposal before the closing date, which is Friday the 17th of September. Due to the uncertainty that continues with regard to travel restrictions, uh, and which may go on for the rest of the year, seminars in the history of collecting will continue to be on Zoom only for the rest of this calendar year. But we take a break during August, and our next seminar um, on the history of collecting is going to take place uh, on Zoom at 5.30 on Monday the 27th of September, when Andrea Morgan, who's a PhD candidate at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario in Canada, is going to present her lecture. Uh, and you can see uh, the date and the title on the screen now. Um, so her lecture is on collecting and displaying Rembrandt's pictures in 18th and 19th century England, Charles Jennings of Gopsall Hall and the Rembrandt Room at Stowe. Once again, Monica and Noe, thank you so much for the fascinating lecture that you compiled together and that was so thank clearly uh, structured and uh, presented by uh, you, Monica. It's absolutely um, fascinating and very unusual subject. On behalf of the Wallace Collection, thank you very much for attending this seminar. We hope to see you again at future seminars, at other online Wallace Collection events, and back in person at the Wallace Collection. And until the 15th of August, so for just three more weeks, you have the opportunity during a visit to the Wallace Collection to see our special exhibition, which unites uh, Rubens's two great landscape, pendant landscapes um, from the Wallace Collection and the National Gallery for the first time in over 200 years. While there's a free entry to the Wallace Collection, tickets to visit the museum do currently need to be booked in advance. 
So I wish you a very uh, enjoyable uh, rest of the summer uh, and look for, hope to see you again um, on the 27th of September. Uh, thank you very much for coming and good evening.